So, thank you all for coming this evening. My name is Lisa Edstrom. As I said before, I am in the education program, and this is the first in our series of talks this semester. We do this every semester um, on STEM education. And what's really wonderful is this is part of our Noise Scholars program. So it's funded by Noise NSF, and we have a scholars program that really helps um, funnel people into STEM education, K-12. So this is part of that, but this particular series is open to the public and we are really excited to have a wide variety of speakers. And tonight we have somebody very special. We have someone from our own campus, Kristen McGuire, who is a, and I don't have to read this because it's a mouthful. <laughs> So, Krista McGuire is a microbial ecologist in the Department of Biology at Barnard and the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology at Columbia University. She received her PhD from the University of Michigan and completed a postdoc at the University of California, Irvine. And her research interests focus on how plant soil microbial feedbacks influence ecosystems, processes, and how these dynamics are impacted by global changes such as urbanization, land use, change, and shifting climate. To address these complex feedbacks, she's currently conducting research in tropical ecosystems of Malaysia and Puerto Rico as well as in green infrastructure in New York City. And what we're going to hear about tonight is our own green roof in New York City, which is actually rather exciting. Um, and as I announced to those who came earlier, we originally had planned to start this talk with a trip to the green roof. But due to a, a conflict of scheduling, we need to slightly delay ourselves going up because there are some people already up there and we need to let them come down before we can go up there. Um, but we're going to be going up shortly, so I turn this over to Professor Ray Wyatt. Great, right, thank you so much for the introduction. All right, let's see if I can sneak around here. All right, and I'll just turn the lights off so you can see the slides better. Well, thank you all for coming, and thanks so much for inviting me to present in this seminar. Today, I'm going to talk about small things in the city. Microbes, mostly I'm gonna focus on fungi, I'll talk a little bit about bacteria, and I'll explain what they are and why they are important. So before I get into the actual research that we're doing in New York City, I wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of the research that we do in my lab. And I see one of my lab students over there. Uh, so in my lab, what we're doing is we are looking at the complex interactions among microbial communities in the soil, plant communities and forest dynamics, and what we call ecosystem function. That's really just a fancy phrase that refers to the flow of nutrients and energy through a system. So something like decomposition, carbon dioxide release into the atmosphere, nitrogen turnover, all of those would be considered ecosystem functions. And most ecosystem functions that we rely on actually are performed by microbes. So they're really, really important in pretty much every single place on the planet. And then ultimately what we want to know is how all of these dynamics respond to global changes that are pretty much caused by humans. So things like global warming, changes in climate, changes in precipitation, conversions of forests to agricultural areas, and urbanization. So I'm gonna focus on urbanization for this talk, but in other sites that we do research in, we focus on a lot of land use conversion from forests to agricultural sites, and also we look at logging. So the ultimate question that we're trying to address in my lab is looking at the ecological mechanisms that contribute to changes in soil microbial composition and function across human land use gradients. 
So I'll explain a little bit more about what that all means for those of you who are not in science. How many of you are in science, in some science-related field? Okay, so we have a lot of people who are non-scientists. That's fine, good to know. I'll try to define everything that I talk about, but if there's something you don't understand or a term I use that you don't know, just raise your hand, feel free to interrupt me, and I'll explain what I'm talking about. So I'm going to first talk a little bit about the problem of urbanization. So urbanization is one important global change that we are experiencing worldwide. Urbanization is when you convert a natural area that is like this, so this natural habitat, this is actually an island, and a little while ago this island was urbanized and now it kind of looks like this. <laughs> so this is actually an image from Eric Sanderson. I don't know if you're familiar with the Manhattan Project, but it's a really neat project where he tried to reconstruct, he's at the, World, the Wildlife Conservation Society in New York, he tried to reconstruct what Manhattan looked like in about the 1600s uh, when some of the first European colonists arrived. Uh, of course, it looked this way for a long time before that as well. But the European colonists came and did some major rearrangements of the biota and the plants and constructed a lot of cement and asphalt. So urbanization is an increasing problem globally, not just in Manhattan. As you can see from this graph, this is the percentage of the world's population on the y-axis. And here you have the year from 1950 projected into 2050. So we are right about here. And the blue is the percentage of the population living in an urban area, and the green is the percentage of the population living in a rural area. So you can see that now the world's population mostly lives in urban centers. The urbanized population has surpassed the rural population, and it's only expected to increase. So urbanization is really a global issue that we need to deal with. So what are some of the problems with urbanization that we need to deal with? Well, some of the obvious ones that we hear about are the urban heat island effect. It's a little warmer in cities than in rural areas. But there's also another problem that really has to do with every time you flush the toilet. So when you flush the toilet, all of that wastewater has to go somewhere. And when you have a concentrated human population living in one area, there's a lot of wastewater that accumulates at a very rapid rate. Think of how many people just in this building have flushed the toilet today. Where does all that wastewater go? We usually don't stop and actually contemplate that. So in this city, it can have one of two fates. The first fate is that it is washed down the pipes and it goes to one of the 14 sewage treatment facilities that we have around the city. All these different colors are different wastewater treatment areas we have. If you've been all the way up north in Riverside Park, uh, close to 125th, you may have seen one of the wastewater treatment facilities we have for this orange zone, which is where we are right now. So if all goes well, the wastewater gets treated at one of these facilities, and ultimately what comes out is a purified version of that wastewater, water that is generally potable and usable for the human population. So that piping system down below our city is called a combined sewer overflow system. So this is a diagram of what happens when you flush the toilet. The wastewater goes down into the piping system and then it goes to a treatment plant. This is what it actually looks like below the city. This is a person, I can't imagine what it smells like right there, but that is the wastewater that is actually traveling in the piping system to a sewage treatment facility. Now the reason it's called a combined sewer overflow system is that sometimes it rains and the storm water actually has to flow into the same piping system. So when there's a precipitation event, what happens is the precipitation goes down the storm drain, it combines with the sewage, and you'll notice that there's another pipe, and once the sewage and storm water reach a specific threshold, it spills out into a waterway. So it's called a combined sewer overflow, and this is just an image of one that is spewing out into the Hudson. 
There are actually over 400 of these outfall locations around the city. So this is one of the reasons why you probably don't want to swim in the waterways around New York City after a rain event like today. You probably would not want to go swimming in the Hudson because there is combined sewage and stormwater flowing into the river. Obviously, this is a major problem and the city has put signs up. You may have seen these signs in various parks by the waterways. This is one from Riverside Park. Uh, that says a wet, water, wet weather discharge point. Don't swim, don't boat, don't drink the water. Uh, so this outfall may discharge rainwater mixed with untreated sewage during or following rainfall and can contain bacteria that cause illness, among many other types of microbes. So obviously this is a major problem in a variety of cities. This is not the only city that has a combined sewer overflow system. Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., a lot of the other major cities around the U.S. have these systems. And it didn't used to be a problem when there were less people. But now that there are, how many people live in New York? Does anyone know? Yeah, it fluctuates depending on whether or not it's workday or not workday, because uh, a lot of people commute to the city, but somewhere around eight or nine million during the day in the city. So every single day we flush about one and a half billion gallons of water into these piping systems. So now that there are more of us, it's become a really big problem that we need to deal with. And the other problem has to do with the makeup of the building materials. So New York City and most cities are constructed with gray infrastructure. We say gray infrastructure because everything looks pretty gray. It's a lot of concrete, a lot of synthetic materials. And what happens when it rains? Where does that water go? Well, it drains off the building into the stormwater system and combines with that sewage. So it's not really an effective system compared to the natural vegetation that used to be here in capturing the precipitation that comes into the city. So what New York City is trying to do now is to convert a lot of this gray infrastructure to something like this. This is green infrastructure. So with green infrastructure, we take vegetation and we put it on the buildings to try and replace some of the, what we call impervious concrete and asphalt in the city that causes water to just flow off. With green infrastructure, you have plants that, and soil that captures the precipitation and then ultimately the water that gets captured will go back into the atmosphere because plants will use the water and they will actually release a lot of the water through the leaves. So it functions more like a natural vegetated system. There's a lot of potential to develop green infrastructure in the city because about 15% of the surface area of the city is actually rooftop. So there's a lot of rooftop available for putting vegetation on buildings. So this has been a major initiative for Mayor Bloomberg's administration back when he was in office, and he allocated one and a half billion dollars over 20 years for implementing green infrastructure specifically to deal with this combined sewer overflow system. So why do you think that they chose to do green infrastructure as opposed to changing the piping system below ground? Could you imagine having to dig up all of those pipes and having the traffic diverted and the roads shut down? I mean, as it is, if we have a single subway that's out of commission for a weekend, we're all in a huffy. Mm -hmm. So completely redoing the piping system is basically off the table. So this is one creative solution to dealing with the problem without having to do something invasive that would actually disrupt the flow of daily activity in the city. So for engineers and for city planners, this is really an engineering problem. Now, when me as an ecologist looks at this, this is a new ecosystem compared to the gray infrastructure that was there. And an ecosystem is really just a habitat where organisms live and reside. So we can think of a forest as an ecosystem, a grassland as an ecosystem. This we now term an urban ecosystem. Urban ecosystems are usually pretty inhospitable to a lot of different life forms. Now, if you construct green infrastructure in the ecosystem, this actually becomes increasingly available habitat to a number of organisms such as insects, birds, and what we're interested in, microbes and other plants that are dispersing across the city. 
in ecological theory, we think of different areas that are essentially like deserts. The city is like a desert to a lot of organisms, except for maybe rats, pigeons, cockroaches, things like that, that are especially adapted at living with humans. For most organisms, the city is like a desert or like a logged forest. Now, in ecology, we have the, this whole theory around increasing connectivity of habitats. So let's say that a bird wanted to migrate from a forest in New Jersey to a forest in a different part of New York, but they had to transverse the city in order to get there. If you have forest patches that are completely isolated from each other and you just have this big desert of a city in the middle, it's really difficult for a bird to migrate from one patch to another. However, if you start implementing new green habitats like green infrastructure, rooftops, more city parks, <coughs> then increasingly the different forest patches become more connected until ultimately it becomes a habitat where lots of different organisms can migrate from one patch to another. Now, ecologically, the reason why this is bad is because in a natural ecosystem, let's say you have a forest over here and a forest where I'm standing, if an organism cannot migrate from one patch to another, the populations in isolated patches will go extinct because they have low diversity and they'll experience inbreeding depression. Right? So inbreeding depression is when you get lots of mutations from breeding with close relatives and ultimately the population declines. So we know as humans that it's really bad to breed with your cousins and your brothers and we have laws against that and it's exactly the same thing for other organisms. If they breed with their close relatives, uh, a lot of mutations happen and it's really bad for ultimately for the population's viability. So by increasing the connectivity, we can actually keep populations alive for a longer period of time. So it's ultimately a beneficial thing for population migration. So that's a little bit of the ecological theory that is behind the research we're doing. We're really interested in the green infrastructure in the city as kind of novel ecosystems that are enhancing connectivity to natural areas surrounding the city. And Green roofs and other types of green infrastructure. When we say green infrastructure, we're talking about things like parks. We're even talking about tree pits. So the trees that are out there by the road that are in their little boxes with soil, that's a type of green infrastructure. If you have a median where there's a grassy area, they plant some flowers, that's another type of green infrastructure. So there are a lot of these different types of green infrastructure that are popping up around the city. They're named so for the green, right? For the plants that inhabit them on top. But below the plants actually is, I would argue, the most important component to green infrastructure, and that's the soil. And in the soil resides an amazingly diverse community of microbes. So microbes are really the organisms that are enabling the plants to survive. Because think about a rooftop ecosystem. You have a lot of sunlight, a lot of UV radiation that's very damaging actually to a lot of plants. A lot of plants can't even survive in that condition. You have high winds, you have shallow soils, frequent droughts. We often equate rooftops to Mars-like ecosystems. So the microbes are enabling these plants to survive those harsh conditions by giving them access to water and other nutrients that would otherwise be depleted if they didn't have the access that they have with the microbes. So what exactly are these microbes? When we're talking about microbes, we're talking about microscopic organisms. So things that you need a microscope to look at. So archaea, these are things that live in, uh, some live in soils, but they live in things like deep sea thermal vents. They tend to be extremophiles. They live in like the, surf, the sulfur pools at Yellowstone. Uh, then we have bacteria. Most people know about bacteria. Fungi and a lot of algae and protists. So these are all different types of microbes. Microbes are the most abundant and diverse organisms on the planet, okay? And the fungi I'm gonna be talking about a little more than the other microbes, because that tends to be my area of expertise. And these are actually critically important in soils. They perform a lot of different functions. Now fungi, you probably mostly know from fruit, what we call fruiting bodies the mushrooms, right? But actually, most of the fungi is below ground in the soil. 
They look like these little stringy hyphae. You've probably seen them um, if you have, say, a piece of moldy bread, all of that stuff, that stringy looking stuff. That's all the hyphae that's below, and that's most of what we find in the soil. The fruiting bodies are kind of like the apples on the tree for the fungi. They're just the reproductive structures. So I'll be talking a lot about fungi, and the fungi are really important because they form associations with plants that enable the plants to survive in these harsh conditions in the urban environment. They also are the ones that can degrade plant material and give nutrients back to the plants. The bacteria have a limit cap limited capability of doing that. So what are we talking about when we talk about microbial diversity? So I told you they're the most diverse organisms on the planet. What does that mean and how do we put that in context? For fungi, it's estimated that there are about one and a half million different species. We've only described about 10% of those species, so a lot of diversity that is still unknown. For bacteria, it gets even worse. I don't know the word for that number, but it's something like 5 times 10 to the 30th. That's how many species of bacteria are estimated to be out there. We've described way fewer than 10% of those. Now, how many species of mammals are there? Just to put it in context, does anybody know? Any science people? 5,400 mammals. So microbes are obviously much more diverse and I would argue much more important and they've actually populated, of course I'm a little biased, they've actually populated the earth for over the last three billion years. So they are used to adapting to changing climatic conditions on the planet. They evolve very rapidly. So we actually expect that they would be able to adapt and evolve in the urban environment in novel ways. And so we're really interested to start looking at that. So the research questions that we've been addressing, and at least for this preliminary study that we first started a few years ago that I'll tell you about, one, do green roofs and parks in New York City function as biodiversity reservoirs for soil microbes? So we know there's this incredible diversity of microbes, but what do we actually find in the city? Are there only a few that can actually tolerate the city? Are there only a few that can live on rooftops? Or do we find a diverse community of them? Two, how much overlap is there in microbial composition of green roofs and city parks? So at the ground, you can think of Central Park, the soil there is quite different than the soil you'd find on a rooftop. So how much overlap is there in the species and how uh, similar are they? And three, does vegetation type influence community composition of green roof microbes? So engineers are usually responsible for putting in green roofs and some landscape architects. They use plants that have been known to survive on rooftops in the past. They're not really interested in the ecology of the system. They're just interested in making the system look good and function well. So the biologists now have come in and said, wait a second, there are tons of different plants that we can use. There are actually about 300,000 different species of flowering plants. So there are probably different combinations that we could put in a green roof to make it function optimally for the desired ecosystem services. And also, maybe if we plant some native plants instead of some exotic plants, which are usually planted, we can attract native biodiversity, so native insects, native birds, things like that. So those are the questions we've been addressing. And I will just stop there, and I will tell you the punchline and give you the results after we go and actually see an example of a green roof. So the Diana Center roof up on top of this building is one of the roofs that we've taken samples of. So I thought it would be nice to just kind of go up there and get a sense for what is a green roof, what does it look like, what are some of the plants that we're talking about, so you have a better sense for the research that we're doing. Sample of one of the green roofs. And this is a map of all of the green roofs that we used for our preliminary studies to really figure out what microbes were residing in green roofs and how they were different from the park soils. So everywhere you see a red dot, that's an experimental green roof that we use. And everywhere you see a, a sunshine star, that's where it's a park that we compared it to. So on the green roofs, they, most of the experimental green roofs we used look a little different than the Diana Center, but those Hempstead Plains and Rocky Summit plant communities are consistent on all of the roofs. And they're planted in an experimental fashion. So we have two plots that are split that have one community on one side and one plant community on the other side. 
They also did a treatment when they set up this experiment in 2010. It was a collaboration with the New York City Parks and Recreation Department and also with Matt Palmer, who's another faculty in um, the Ecology Department at Columbia. And they also did an experiment where they varied the depth of the growing media. We didn't analyze the depth because I don't think that's going to make too much of a difference for our purposes. So we just looked at the six inch communities. But this is an example of what it looks like in the middle of the growing season. The red line I just put in there to show you the division. On one side, you can see the uh, Hempstead Plains community and the other side, you can see the Rocky Summit. So for all of these 10 experimental roofs that we have planted with the same configuration, the same exact soil, the same exact timing of planting, we sampled all of the plots and we took six samples per growing box and combined them together to get a representative sample of that particular growing box. And then we sequenced and sampled three growing boxes per roof. We're calling this our general sampling for all 10 roofs. And this was really just to get an overview of what was there on the different rooftop communities. We then wanted to evaluate further the what we call fine scale sampling of the microbial communities because we wanted to see if there was clustering of microbial communities across three of the roofs and I've highlighted them the one all the way up north Jackie Robinson one in Chelsea and one down in Staten Island we call that Lyons and for all of these roofs we instead of putting all these soil cores together and homogenizing them we sequenced every single one analyzed them individually. So we did a really intensive sampling to see if there was autocorrelation with the sample. So if this sample was closer to that one, does it mean that those communities were more similar than that community was to that one? Because that would have a lot of implications for how we sample on our roof communities. Also, we wanted to separately look at the plant communities to see if the vegetation type influenced what we were finding. And then we sampled nearby parks, those three parks that you just saw on that map, Chelsea, um, Lyons, and Jackie Robinson. And we sampled the parks in a similar fashion. We took a plot, so we have a representative sample of our ecosystem. We took five soil cores, combined them together, and then we have three representative samples per park. So in addition to those three parks that I showed you that are next to those roofs that we intensively sampled, we also sampled the High Line because it's a major tourist destination and we thought it would be an interesting community to look at to see how it compared to our rooftop communities and to our parks because it's kind of an intermediate between a rooftop park and a ground level park. So we thought it would be fun to look at. And those are some of my students, former students who were sampling. And then we also sampled Central Park. We set up a variety of plots across Central Park and we actually did five plots there because the park is so big rather than just the three plots that we did in the smaller parks. Also, we wanted to make sure we included Central Park because it's the largest green space in New York City. So if there is any chance for inoculum going up into the air, so inoculum is just uh, fungi and bacteria that can colonize other areas. There's actually a lot of that in the air. We're always breathing in bacteria and fungi all the time. So if any of that inoculum from the soil in Central Park could go into the air and colonize the rooftops, Central Park would probably be a prime location where a lot of the inoculum was coming from. So we also did our sampling from the time that the roof was planted. So before they even put plants on, we had some spontaneous weeds we had to get rid of first. Um, so from the time the roof was planted with just soil, we've sampled and we've sampled every single July since 2010. And we're gonna keep doing that over time for about 10 years to look at community assembly over time of these systems, to look at how they're changing and evolving. Uh, so for today's talk, I'm mostly gonna show you the results of our July 2011 sampling. So how do we collect a soil? Well, what we do is we take a soil core, which is that metal contraption you see up there. We wear gloves to protect not ourselves from the microbes, but the soil sample from our own bacteria. Because if we got a sample back and we found out there are a bunch of hand bacteria colonizing green roof community, it would be a little suspicious. So we protect our own hand bacteria from colonizing the sample, and we put the soil into sterile collection bags so that there's no microbial contamination. And then we put ethanol on the soil core in between each sampling to sterilize the soil core. And then we store our samples in the freezer, negative 20 degrees Celsius, until we do our analyses. 
These are the two basic analyses that we do, or that we did for these samples. We take our soil, we homogenize it by sieving it, and which is basically just mixing it all together. It's like putting soil through a blender. And then we extract DNA, we sequence the fungi, we sequence the bacteria. Then we also extract all of the lipids. You can think of the lipids in soil really as the approximation for the total amount of microbes you have. Lipids degrade really quickly. So the quantity of lipids in the soil is a really good proxy for the amount of living microbes that were there. And the lipids, this is what the lipids look like. It really just looks like, um, you know, when you have a really greasy piece of pizza and that oil drips off onto your plate. That's really what it looks like when you extract them all from the soil. And then we have different ways using chemistry techniques to determine which lipids came from bacteria and which lipids came from fungi. So what did we find? We found a lot of microbes. We found 1,700 approximately species of fungi and over 20,000 different species of bacteria. And this is really just a small sampling of all the microbes that could possibly be living in green spaces in New York City. So we just looked at 10 roofs and five parks, right? So if you think about all of the soil that's covering the city, there's probably a lot of diversity that we didn't actually get. So it seems like microbes are pretty good at adapting to the urban habitat. And just to show you our results from the Diana Center, because we did actually sequence the fungi and the bacteria up there, we found, and this is a student's uh, sampling from where you just saw, we found over 200 species of fungi and a little over 5,000 species of bacteria just on the Diana Center, just in that small space. And even from that small space, we were even subsampling little areas of soil on that rooftop community. So incredible diversity of microbes, actually more diverse than we originally expected. And this is an image of some of the fungi that we cultured on petri dishes to try and get a better estimate for what species were up there. So in the experimental roof systems, remember we wanted to know how much overlap there was with the microbial communities that you find, say, in the city parks. Well, we found that each community, the green roof and the park system, they're pretty unique. There's only about 400 different species. And I'm going to say species. We really work in the language that's called OTUs, which are operational taxonomic units. And it has to do with how similar a DNA sequence is to another DNA sequence. If they're 97% similar or more, we call them the same OTU or species. So I'll just use species for the ease of conversation, but just know there are a lot of challenges with identifying species for microbes, as you can probably imagine based on the number of species I showed you that are, they're estimated to exist. So green roofs and parks have pretty different communities. This is just the number of species that we find unique to green roofs, unique to parks, and then shared across them. And then we can actually plot all of our DNA sequence data on this ordination. This plot does not have any axes. Each point here represents the entire fungal community of a single soil sample. And what we do is we compare the entire fungal community of one sample to another, and then to another, and then to another, until we compare it to every single other sample. The more similar the community is, the closer the points are together on this figure. The more different they are, the further apart the points are. So then we can do some statistics and estimate whether or not these communities that cluster together are statistically clustered or if they just happen to be clustered by chance. You can probably see here that we have a lot of clustering and it is significant. You probably don't even need to do any math to see that. So the green points here are the green roof fungal communities. These are all the park communities, and interestingly enough, these are the high line fungi. So the high line was actually intermediate in between the green roofs and the parks, which makes sense based on how it's constructed. How many people have been to the high line? Have most of you been to the high line? Most of you have. Okay, so you know it's a little bit elevated, but there is a little more soil in there than you would typically find in a green roof. So I thought this result was pretty interesting. Now, when we looked at just the park communities, 
It was also interesting to note that each individual park also had its unique fungal community. So this is kind of like looking a little more in depth at what fungi were in the individual parks. And then if we looked at the roof communities, it's hard to tell from this figure because we only had three samples per roof in our general sampling. And also because this graph actually is in multidimensional space, it's just collapsed into two dimensional space for the ease of viewing. If you actually do the algorithms to figure out whether or not say these orange triangles are more similar to each other than say to the stars out there, uh, it turns out that each, each roof did have a unique fungal community. But we actually wanted to test that a little more in depth because if you're just looking at this, it kind of looks like a smattering and you don't actually know that there's clustering unless you do the mathematical algorithms to detect clustering. So that's where our fine scale sampling comes in. Remember, we took individual cores and we analyzed these all individually as opposed to the general sampling where we put all the cores together, mixed it up, and we had kind of a coarse approximation of our community. So for the fine scale sampling, I'm going to show you data just from these three roofs here where we did this intensive sampling. So these three roofs, Chelsea, Jackie Robinson, and Lyons, are they different from each other? Yes, it's pretty obvious by looking at this one. When we increase our sample size, we can get better resolution for how the communities cluster according to each roof. Now, this was actually a surprising result to us because the roofs were planted in 2010 and already a year later in 2011, we're finding that certain roofs are having their own unique communities. Why would that be? Well, one of the reasons may have to do with what we call microsite variation across the city. This is an image that one of my collaborators made, uh, Rob Dunn at NC State, North Carolina, where he basically mapped building surface temperatures of Manhattan across the entire city because we have a number of samples from other projects where we're sequencing bacteria and fungi and we're trying to understand the correlates to the variation. So the darker the red, the warmer the building surface temperature is on average. So you can see there's actually quite a bit of variation. So if you sample a community from this roof over here that's really warm on average, and you compare it to say the roof down there, which is essentially kind of what we did, it may be that the fungi are diverging from each other because of the differences in temperature. And the differences in temperature affect the amount of moisture that's in the soil, which can also affect the amount of nutrients that are in the soil. So what you have is really these divergent systems based on just this fine scale, what we call microsite variation in climate across the city. So that was one pretty interesting result. So the other question that we wanted to address was how does the plant community influence the compositional differences that we could be observing? So for our fine scale sampling, we had the separate cores from the Hempstead Plains and the Rocky Summit. And there's a picture just to remind you. And what we found is that there is absolutely no effect of vegetation on the fungal communities. This was also surprising to us. We expected actually the plant community to have a more significant impact on the fungi than the geographical location in the city. However, when we thought about this some more, we took a look at the species composition of the two different plant communities. So here are the plants that make up the Hempstead Plains and here are the plants that make up the Rocky Summit. You might recognize some of these from their common names. Here are the Latin names. Take a look at the plant families. We have Apocinaceae, Asteraceae, Fabaceae, Poaceae. Down here we have Asteraceae, Fabaceae, Lamaceae, and Poaceae. They're pretty similar, right? In terms of the families of plants that are in these two communities, they're actually not that different from each other. From a fungal perspective, the fungus doesn't really care what plant species are there. What they're really detecting is the chemistry in the environment. And plant families tend to have very similar chemistry. So species that are within the same family tend to have very similar chemistries in their leaves and their roots. So the fungi are probably responding to similar chemistry in both plant communities, so there's not much of a difference. I expect that if we had a sedum community also as another control, we would actually find an effect of the vegetation, and that's something that we're looking at now 
to see if that is the case. So that was kind of interesting. Another result that we found that I think is probably pretty significant to the management of green roofs is that we have a lot of what we call mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi, a mycorrhiza, just to define it for those of you who uh, haven't done intro bio, it's a mutualistic association, which means that it's a partnership. So both the plant and the fungus is receiving benefit from this partnership. And the plant, this occurs in the plant root. So this is a plant root right here, and all of this white stuff here is fungal tissue that's emanating from this mycorrhiza where the plant is living in association with the fungus. Now, plants are green. So for those of you who are not science people, what does it mean to be green? What does that allow you to perform? Photosynthesis, photosynthesis. excellent. So photosynthesis allows you to take sunlight and carbon dioxide and convert them into sugars. Fungi do not have that capability, so they are often sugar limited. So if they associate with a plant that can make sugars, then it's kind of like a free glucose dose for them. So they get the sugars from the plant, and then the fungi, you'll notice, are much more abundant and they're smaller and they can emanate out into the soil as compared to the little plant roots. So what do you think that the fungi are probably giving to the plant? Nutrients from the soil, exactly. So it's a partnership and both are benefiting. And green roof ecosystems, you would imagine that this would be a really good partnership to have because the soils are very low in nutrients and they're also very dry. So the fungi also help the plant get water. And what we found was an amazing abundance of mycorrhizal fungi. We actually found more mycorrhizal fungi in the green roofs than we found in the ground level parks. And we think it's because it's a harsher habitat for plants, so the plants are actually more reliant on the fungi. These are just different genera of mycorrhizal fungi, and this is what you see in the plant root. So if you actually take a plant root and you bleach it, and then you stain the fungal tissue blue, if you ever looked at a plant root under a microscope, it's kind of square. So that's a single plant root cell. And this structure in here, this blue thing, it looks like a tree. That is the site of resource exchange. That's a fungal structure that is exchanging carbon for soil nutrients. And these blue things up here are where the fungi actually store sugars. So it's a storage organ. Uh, so we found a lot of mycorrhizal fungi. We found actually 150 some species of mycorrhizal fungi. There are only 500 species described in the world. So this was quite an incredible diversity just on 10 green roofs around New York City. So we we're quite shocked to find that many mycorrhizal fungi. So we're looking more into their role in green roof plant survival. Another interesting finding was that the fungi that were most abundant in the green roof and also in the park soils were fungi that are really good at adapting to human dominated environments. So when we looked in the literature, a lot of these fungi here, these species, have been found in areas that are contaminated from mining, that are contaminated from human pollution. Uh, so a lot of these fungi actually have the capability, we think, according to their taxonomic designation, according to their name, to actually break down pollutants in the environment. So we're now actually looking further into how they're doing that and whether or not these microbes are more adapted to living in polluted environments in urban centers. So all of these results that we obtained from the July 2011 sampling, we published in a paper last year. Was it last year? No, two years ago now. And oh no, it was last year, I think, 2013. And all of these uh, highlighted co-authors were undergraduates from Barnard in our lab. So a lot of undergraduates who participated in the research. Uh, it was nice for them to get published. And then a graduate student in my lab. And then my collaborator from Columbia and two of my collaborators from Colorado. So this was a, a somewhat creative title that the students came up with. I, did, I cannot take credit for making that title. Uh, so. In addition to publishing the results in a paper, we also incorporated some of this work into the classroom. So last year, last spring, I taught microbiology lab, and we did what's called a project lab. I know some of you are training to be teachers. How many people are training to be teachers in here? Some of you are in the, the noise program or thinking about it. Uh, so there's a lot you can actually do with students in lab courses where you're actually generating data. 
And so we took this opportunity to take students, this is the class picture up here, on the Randall's Island Green Roof, which is the largest green roof across all the boroughs in New York. Um, and we had them design projects and sample over 400 different green roofs and tree pits and city medians and parks across the city. So we're kind of branching out, not just doing the 10 experimental roofs, but trying to really get a sense for what are the microbes that are in all the different types of green infrastructure across the city. And this is a picture of them uh, taking samples on one of the roofs. Here are the pots that you just saw upstairs on the Diana Center. These are the pots that we first grew in the greenhouse here, over the greenhouse that's on top of Millbank that you probably can see. And we took the inoculum that we collected, like I mentioned, and we did this experiment. And then we would go into the lab and the students would extract DNA, do amplifications, do a lot of other analyses where they're looking at the microbes. And we're currently finishing up analyzing some of the data that they collected to publish in another paper. And all the students from that lab will then be co-authors on that paper. So it's kind of a fun learning experience for them to go through the whole scientific process. And this is the diagram for the urban to rural gradient soils that we collected for that class and what we used for that experiment that I showed you up on the green roof. We took soils from three parks in rural New Jersey, three suburban parks in New Jersey, and then three urban parks in New York. And this follows what we call an urban to rural gradient that, that tracks population density, as you can see on that map. We then looked at that inoculum by itself without adding it to the plants. And what's interesting is that we found when we used those lipids that I told you that we extracted to look at how many microbes were in the soil, we found that if you look at the total microbial biomass, which is the total amount of microbial lipids that we extracted, in the forest soil, you find the most microbes, which you would expect, and it goes down as we would predict to the suburbs and then ultimately to the urban ecosystem. So there is an effect of urbanization on microbes. So there are fewer microbes in an urban soil, at least in the parks, than you would find, say, in a forest ecosystem. But we're still finding an impressive diversity of them. So then we took this inoculum from the three different sites and we added it to the different plants in the pots. And we're trying to see if somehow we can actually manage the soil that we're adding into green infrastructure in the city to make it function and perform more optimally. So for example, if you have more microbes in the forest soil that are able to say retain water or degrade pollutants, maybe we can take some forest soil and add some of it to our green roofs or to other city park areas and enable those parks to perform better than how they're performing already. Because a lot of the soil they're planted with is just soil that we dig up around the city and um, the parks department uses it. So it'll be interesting to analyze the results of that experiment. And then like I mentioned, we're also trying to understand how a lot of these microbes in the city are functioning in pollution mitigation. So the urban setting, one of the problems of urbanization, as you know, is that we have higher levels of air pollution. And that pollution gets deposited on the ground. There's a lot of diesel exhaust also that goes into the soil. So those things need to be degraded. And microbes are really the only things that are capable of degrading them. So what we're doing is we are taking those microbes, bringing them into the lab, and we're extracting RNA to try and figure out how they're expressing genes that are related to pollution <coughs> degradation. And this is a list of the some of the genes that we're going to be looking at. These are genes involved in degrading these things, which are basically just nasty compounds that you would find in urban pollution. And so I have a student and a postdoc right now, an undergrad and a postdoc, working on trying to get that technique up and running uh, because it's quite tricky to get RNA. RNA is what happens when your gene is turned on and it's actually expressing to make a protein. And that process happens really rapidly. So you have to collect a soil and put it into liquid nitrogen immediately and bring it back to the lab to do the analysis. So it's a really, really quick process because RNA degrades very, very rapidly once it's expressed. So we're trying to get this up and running. Uh, and I think this will be really exciting because if we can figure out which microbes are expressing genes to degrade organic contaminants and pollution in the city, we can then actually manipulate inoculum, right? So we can grow some microbes that are better at degrading certain contaminants and we can add them to our ecosystem and help clean up the soil. 
which ultimately will clean up the water that is going into that stormwater overflow system. Because it's not just the sewage that's problematic, it's also the contaminants in the soil that are being infiltrated into the stormwater that's getting deposited out into the uh, river systems. So ultimately, this is the goal of this research project now, is we're really trying to optimize high performance green infrastructure. So we're not just designing a green roof to look nice. We're not just designing a green roof to mitigate storm water. We're designing a green roof to have multi-functional purposes, such as enhancing native biodiversity, capturing storm water, degrading organic pollutants in the environment. Uh, and also another big factor that we're starting to look at that we think is really important in some of these urban settings is dog urine. So not in green roofs per se, but in tree pits and medians and parks, you probably see a lot of dogs. There are actually a third as many dogs as humans in this city. So we think that's really another issue that we need to deal with in these green spaces because when you add dog urine, you decrease the number of microbes, which decreases all the other benefits that the microbes are performing in these systems. So that's another avenue of research that we're starting to explore. So that project is now turned into a big collaborative project. It's been funded by the National Science Foundation, and these are all of the collaborators that we're working with. We're doing a lot of work with engineers, with climate scientists, with social scientists, with a lawyer even, uh, trying to really figure out how to optimize all of the benefits of green infrastructure, including the psychological benefits that people gain by having green infrastructure in their environment, uh, and try and figure out how we can build them to maintain uh, optimally functioning green infrastructure in the city. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge a lot of people and some funding sources, and I will take any questions that you have. Yes. So the, the plants on the rooftop, are they um, resistant to the cold weather in the wintertime? They are. They go dormant in the winter. Yeah, just like all the other plants would in the natural ecosystem here, they're adapted to being in a temperate climate. Okay. So they turn brown and then they shut off everything and then they wait for spring to come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what have you found from the soil samples that you have the forest and the suburban and the urban? Like what have your findings been so far? The findings have been, so I showed that one graph, we're finding that there are actually more microbes in the forest compared to the suburbs. It decreases in the suburbs and then it decreases even more in the urban environment. So we're finding actually that we have more fungi in the urban environment compared to the suburban and the forest. We think because fungi are actually better at resisting stress than bacteria because fungi tend to be a little bigger, their cells are a little thicker, they're more capable of degrading a lot of these complex compounds, and they're also better at surviving desiccation, so when it gets really dry. So we haven't finished sequencing the DNA of all of those samples, but in terms of just looking at the composition and how many bacteria versus fungi, those are the findings <coughs> that we have so far. Mm -hmm. So the city has already started putting in green roofs? Correct. Yes. And so are you like using your findings along the way to help that or are you hoping like at the end you'll have some big answer for them? We are trying. It's <laughs> been a little challenging because they have an agenda and they already planned a lot, at least the Department of Environmental Protection, they already planned what plants they're putting in to a lot of these different types, not necessarily just the green roofs, but also the city medians, the tree pits, other types of green infrastructure. They already have a palette of plants they're working with. So we've been trying to tell them that we want to do research on what they've put in already to inform what they're putting in next, but they plan a year in advance. Mm -hmm. So for the next couple of years, they already have things figured out, but we're hoping that after we start getting data back for this grant in the next couple of years, we can then give them information that will allow them to perhaps tweak what plants they're putting in and inform their management. That's ultimately the goal. For the private companies, so there are two different ways that they gave the money for Plan NYC. One was to the DEP, they just gave them a lump sum and said, plant a bunch of tree pits, plant a bunch of medians, let's get things in the ground now because we need to deal with this stormwater overflow problem immediately. The other sum of money, private companies and individuals can apply for grants 
to put in green infrastructure in their own facility. That could be a green roof, it could be a park, it could be a median. Uh, and those private owners, we do feel like we can communicate with more. And there is a list in the city of what's been approved in terms of who has been successful with getting grants. And so we are trying to be in communication with those owners and hopefully work with the landscape architects to figure out how to implement the best planting strategy. The problem is we don't have all the information yet because it's still a new project. We really just started this in 2010. So we're hoping that over the years, over the course of Plan NYC, by the end of it, we'll have much more information to inform what goes in beyond that. Yes. I'm just curious about how you identify each of the microbes and bacteria in the lab. Are you going through like a little booklet to identify everything? We are not. That would, that would be very tedious. Yeah, no, we actually sequence the DNA and then we get one representative DNA sequence for each cluster of what we're calling OTUs or species. We take that one representative sequence and we put it into the public database of, called GenBank and we use an algorithm that is called the BLAST algorithm that was actually developed by Altschul whose grandmother that building was named after. Uh, and so we use the actual BLAST algorithm in GenBank, where GenBank is where they just have DNA sequences of basically everything that's ever been sequenced and named, and a lot of things that haven't been named. And then the algorithm matches our unknown with a known sequence in GenBank, and that's how we place the name that's on our unknown. Efficient. Yes, it's much more efficient, yes. <laughs> yeah. How did you guys get started with this project? That's a good question. So when I first took the job here, which was uh, about five, five or six years ago now, uh, I only worked really in tropical rainforests. I dabbled a little bit in the boreal forest up in Alaska, but mostly worked in the tropics. And one of my collaborators in the ecology department at Columbia, he said, hey, I'm putting in this green roof experiment next year, and I'm working with the plants. One of my students is working with the insects. If you'd like to have a local field site, it'd be kind of cool to look at the microbes. And I thought, yeah, actually, that would be nice to have a field site where you didn't have to travel halfway across the world and pay $2,000 for a plane ticket to go all the way to Malaysia. You just go on the subway and get to your field site. And then the more I thought about it, the more I realized that the questions that I wanted to ask actually fit in really well with the rest of the research program. And then it just kind of spiraled out from there. And then I started talking to other people who worked in green roofs. And then we connected with the engineers. And so we started having, I organized monthly meetings with all of these different people who were interested in green roofs from all different disciplines. And that eventually turned into a green roof symposium where all of us gave presentations on some of the research we were doing. And then eventually we wrote that NSF proposal based on that. So it was kind of this organic process that unfolded. Mm -hmm. Organic, coming. <laughs> Yes. How would you describe the process of conducting the research? The process of conducting the research depends on what part of the research. The, there's field work and then there's lab work. And they are quite different experiences. Um, some people really like the field, some people really like the lab, some people like a good healthy balance of both. In the field, it's very hot in the summer, collecting samples of new roofs. You have to kind of go all over the city, which I think is fun because you get to see all different parts of the city. You have to sometimes climb up on scary ladders and get to the root boxes to take your samples. Um, and then it's quite tedious collecting all the samples and making sure you're sterilizing and getting everything, putting it in the bag, labeling it properly. And then when you come back to the lab, it's a whole different experience because you're taking the soil you're homogenizing it and you're just really working with tiny, tiny molecules. So you're, you're doing really chemistry to get the DNA out and then you're doing organic chemistry to get the lipids out. Uh, we actually collaborate with a chemist in Barnard, Dina Merer, uh, to use her gas chromatograph instrument to actually analyze a lot of our samples. So it's really a lot of chemistry in the lab. So it's a different type of tedium than in collecting samples in the field. So I would describe the whole process as tedious, but that's science in general. All of science really is tedious. But it's fun because you get to use the tedium to answer really big, I think, important questions. The carbon and the nutrient exchange between the fungi and plants, mm -hmm. what, it, um, what, a, like, what does the fungi use the carbon for? 
Uh, they use the carbon mostly for growing, so for synthesizing new cells. So in all of our cells, we actually have a lot of carbon. And fungal cells are made up of even more carbon than our cells are. So they're using it really for structural components of the cells. Um, chitin, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, like on the outside of an insect, you know how the shell is hard? Mm -hmm. That's made of a ton of carbon called chitin. Fungi use the same exact polymer for their cells. It's called chitin. So there's a lot, it's very carbon intensive to build those cells. Anything else? All right. Well, thanks everyone. It was fun.